Welcome to the second talk. I'd like to introduce two Jedi Masters for today. Uh, David Rook and Chris Weissopel. Guys. Okay, so we've kind of um, written this talk in a way that it's kind of two talks in one. So um, I'm going to start off writing uh, the first part of the talk here, um, which kind of talks more about working with developers and, and the local management within um, an SDLC, so people responsible for delivery. And then Chris is going to um, talk more about kind of selling uh, and getting executive and, and management level buy-in for application security. And I guess that's why I'm in the t-shirt and Chris is in the suit today. So we can communicate well <laughs> to our constituents. Exactly. Um, and we kind of split it up like that because in our day jobs, you know, those are the, the main areas that we focus on. So I would work primarily with developers and kind of within a development team. And Chris, obviously, is the CTO of, of an application security company, would work a lot with helping people understand how to get that kind of management level buy-in and ultimately spend money on application security. Okay, so, yep. away. so I'll, I'll start off here. So my name's David Rook, as you've probably seen on the agenda and on, on the first slide there. Um, I work as a security analyst for Relex Payments in Dublin. So my job is, is full-time application security. So that would include everything from kind of getting management to commit to do an application security, application security resourcing, as well as things like security code reviews, threat model, pen testing, and so on. Um, I guess a lot of people would probably know me be better as Security Ninja on Twitter or through the Security Ninja website. Um, I do a lot of other things, as you can see on the screen there. The, the point at the bottom about a tool called Agnisio, that's what I'm presenting on this afternoon if you want to find out more about that. So I guess this is my, the agenda for my part of the talk, and it's really how can you work with developers and how can you help developers get what they need to help you? So how can you give them the information, the tools, the processes that they need to um, write secure code, which ultimately is what you want to achieve? And then secondly, translating what I call application security alien into the business language. Because as much as I think most probably don't want to get involved with business language and business people, they, at the end of the day, are the people who sign off on just about everything. So if you want application security resourcing, you need money. If you want tools, you need not always money, but you need uh, you know, the business to accept of the cost of putting those things into a development life cycle, for example. So again, it's more of taking the things we talk about and, and figuring out how we put those things into a format and definitions that the business cares about. So firstly, from my experience, both at Relax and, and other places and conferences and so on, um, maybe the, the first bullet point there is not completely true. Most developers don't come up to me and say, I want to write secure code. But what I've found is I've, I've yet to come across a developer who's told me they don't want to write secure code. So it's not like you're fighting a completely uphill battle with the developers. Um, but what you need to understand is that you need to own the application security problems for them in, in some ways. It shouldn't just be a case of um, producing a list of vulnerabilities and then giving it to them and walking away. If your job is to produce secure code and secure applications, you need to help them achieve secure code. And just giving them a report full of vulnerabilities with severity 5 or whatever it might be doesn't give them um, a feeling that you're, you're e as equally eager to get that code written securely as, as you want them to be. So when I talk about owning the problem with them, I don't mean writing the code for them, but I mean help them understand the code they need to write to fix the issues you've come up with. And if developers need um, a process surrounding that, so whether it's you know, the fact that you have to get in, uh, security ingrained in the SDLC maybe, or the fact that if things like security uh, requirements aren't in requirements document, in documents, sorry, then you could still actually argue the developer is doing their job if they don't write secure code. And I know that sounds a bit confusing, but if we don't have security in there as a requirement because we haven't owned the application security problem, then they're probably not going to write secure code. And something Chris said to me recently to, uh, along a similar vein there was that if they did go and write secure code, then arguably they're not doing their job because they, they didn't build the application as per the requirements and the design that was signed off. 
So owning that and making sure they have everything that they need in place to write a secure code is, is vital. And um, what you can also try and use is, developers generally like to write quality code. Not all of them, because we've all used products which are, are far from being a quality application. But in general, I found developers like producing something that is quality, something that they can generally be proud of. And you'll also find a lot of businesses want to produce quality products. Now, if you can work to, in some ways, change the definition of quality within your business to include security, um, then you can use that because if the developers want to write quality code and you can include security as part of quality, I'm not saying they're the same thing, but if your definition of quality or, or probably more specifically a good application in your business includes security, then you'll find it a lot easier to get them right and secure code. And then finally, what I found from developers is they want the right knowledge, the right practices, the right processes and the right tools. And I know in some ways that probably sounds a little bit obvious, that they want the right knowledge. But then for a second, think about if you're a developer or a security person, how you do secure development education. Or what, if you're a developer, what developer education um, programs have you been subjected to? I use subjected as, as a word there specifically because some are terrible and they don't give the developers the knowledge they need. And that's kind of... This comment recently I saw on, on a blog that I was commenting on kind of really reinforced that uh, with me, that this guy, Jim Bird, come along and he said, look, in the context of talking about getting developers to write secure code, that's what the blog was talking about, he said that he's a software guy, and what he wants is he, he wants practices and tools that actually work. So not just saying, oh yeah, we'll follow the Microsoft SDL, because that might be great if you're Microsoft, but if you're a very small company, that probably doesn't make sense. So making sure that whatever you're putting in place will actually work in your environment. And more specifically, they must help, him get him, help them get software out of the door, better software that's more reliable and more secure. So what can we do to help developers? So, and we do need to help developers because ultimately they're the ones who will determine whether your application security program produces secure code or not because they're the people writing that code. So... And then the first bullet point, again, to me, seems like one that's almost too obvious for me to put in the presentation. But I'm saying make sure that you help developers understand how to write secure code. And again, think back to developer education, things that you've seen or you've been through. And how many of them actually taught you how to write secure code? So if you've gone on secure development training courses or whatever it might be, how many of them sat you down and actually taught you how to write secure code. In my experience and from seeing what's out there in the marketplace, probably very few of, of um, the developers who we want to write secure code have actually been taught how to write secure code. We teach them about vulnerabilities and then we get them to exploit it in something like WebGoat. But then we hope that from there they can kind of figure <coughs> out how to write their secure code. Or if we do cover secure coding, it's probably for maybe 10% of the time, whereas the other 90% of the time we're talking about vulnerabilities and exploits. You need to really think about the way you're doing your training and figure out whether you're trying to give them a web app pen testing kind of 101 course or whether you're actually teaching them to write secure code. And really, if, you, if your training doesn't include some element of secure coding, then your developers are never actually going to write secure code because you've not taught them what they need to know. And then just to reiterate the point about owning application security problems with them. Make sure that rather than being seen, seen as an auditor within the team, that you're seen as a teammate. That you're as equally concerned about getting software out of the door. You've got your own agenda. Obviously, it needs to be secure software. But understand that the thing that, I guess, drives their bonuses and their performance reviews is whether they're getting code produced on time. If you show concern for that and you show that you're willing to help them do security right but also meet their deadlines, then again, from my experience, that's been very useful. And then the final point there is, is, is very important. Um, don't dictate to them. Don't go to them with the attitude of, um, I'm the security person. I know about these difficult security problems, so I'm better than you. Um, we might not all do that, but there are loads of people in security who do have that attitude, who go along with the, I'm the security person, you must do what I say and don't ever dare question me. 
But the problem is, on, on the flip side, th we're talking about development, which means that they actually probably know more about actually writing a piece of code to prevent the issues you're finding than you do. So in some ways, they could come with that smug, I'm better than you attitude as well. But from my experience, they don't tend to. They, they mock my code because I'm not a developer and I write code, but not in the same way. So rather than dictating to them and say, you must write secure code, speak with them um, and help, under, help to uh, learn from them as well so you can learn from each other. But then finally, when you learn from them, the things you get back from them, try and use that information to improve things for them. And one example of that at Relex was that we spoke with our developers because one of the things we did is the security staff for application and security sit with the developers in the same team, same managers. So we, we just, um, this the same as those guys in terms of our performance as a department is measured on getting an application delivered on time and security is just part of that. But to improve things, we, we spoke with the developers about security testing. And what they said was that when we go out of the development phase, we've done some level of kind of functional and QA testing. So we at least know our code works. Um, it, 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 it's somewhat um, a, a way towards doing what it's supposed to do. But the problem is when, when we look at security testing, we've got no idea what you're going to find two or three phases along in the SDLC, which is a problem for us. Is there any way that we can start doing some security testing ourselves, just the same way as we do functional and kind of regression testing ourselves as well? So we took that away and we, we, we had a, a think about how we could enable that for them. And, and to cut a long story short, the approach we took was in the, the threat models the security staff create, um, kind of at the design phase of the SDLC, we write very clear security test cases now, really clear. Um, whereas before they were used by the same security staff a lot of the time, so they, they weren't that useful to developers, but now they're very clear. And then what we did is we invested in, a, in a, a license for Burp Suite Pro for every one of our developers. So all security staff, all testing staff, and all developers have a copy of this tool now um, on their desktop. And they're, they're given for every single project the test cases that they should probably run based on the threats and the risks we've identified in the threat model. So again, it's a case to speak with them and, and learn from them and then improve things from there. So then next up is, is, like I said, what I call application security alien. And I guess when we talk in terms of things like injections and jackings and pollings, it probably makes sense to all of us. But ultimately, all of us in this room and probably many other security people, we're not generally the ones who sign off checks. We're not the ones who make commitments on fixing these issues. If those people don't understand what the hell we're talking about, they won't sign the checks for tools, they won't sign checks for resources, they won't accept the cost of adding all these additional deliverables into their SDLC. If you go to them and talk about these three things, then they might think more along these lines. You know, we're talking about injections and, and jackings and ponings. So, uh, <laughs> if, if, if in their head, if that's what your findings look like, um, I don't think you're going to get the, the commitment you need from the business to address your issues. So there are different ways of approaching this. So I guess what I'm looking at here is more of um, how you get kind of delivery managers or whoever's responsible within like the SCLC for getting code out of the door. How do you get them to fix issues you find? Um, Chris is going to cover this a lot more in, in his slides of how you take that upper level in the business? How do you get management and kind of um, C-level people in the business to actually sign off the checks? Or to even say, look, as a business as a whole, we're making a commitment to write secure code from now on. Um, so it, the, the things that I'll talk about is more kind of aimed at convincing uh, a project manager that he needs to delay his project for a week because the issue you've found isn't well, isn't a, a golden My Little Pony, but it's actually something that could really be a, a serious issue for the business. Okay, so it's following on from that a little bit as well as we kind of sometimes te speak what outside of our community are, are weird languages. Um, but we then sometimes present those things in, in weird formats as well. Formats that, again, may make sense to us, but again, we're not generally the ones making the, the final decision 
on fixing these things or investing in application security. So something that I've spoken about quite a few times, uh, particularly on Twitter, is CVSS. And its use um, as a, a way of scoring vulnerabilities can be useful um, in certain situations, but probably outside of the application, or not just the application security, but outside of the security team, your findings will probably make very little sense to the business. So let's take a look at a make-believe SQL injection vulnerability. And this is the CVSS calculator, which if you just you know, Google for CVSS, the website has got a lot of good information on it. And I should say I'm not saying CVSS is a way of scoring vulnerabilities is bad. I'm just saying that it's not probably the way you want to then present the real risk of these issues to the business. So using the calculator, you have like a base score, so you fill in the base score, which is mandatory, and then you have environmental and temporal scores, which are, um, which are optional. So you can fill those in, they're all put together, and they give you a score. In fact, they give us you know, a few different scores, as you can see there. But what it's telling us is that our SQL injection vulnerability, which from filling these fields in, is exploitable um, via the network, needs no authentication, could lead to a catastrophic loss of data to the business, um, for up to 25% of our systems and a few other things there. And that gives us a score of 2.2. Now, I don't use CVSS very much, so I really couldn't tell you what 2.2 means. I certainly, what I could tell you though is what 2.2 is a score in terms of risk means and relics. It means that that's never going to get looked at. And I'll show you why in a second. Because you need to look at, well, before we move on to it, I just wanted to put these in, in here how those scores are calculated. So how do we get to a, a score of 2.2? Well, this is how we calculate the base score, which for us was 8.3. And then we throw in these as well. This one's actually probably the simplest one, the temporal equation, and then the environmental equation. So I looked at them, and I thought, I, I'm actually not even going to try and figure out how we got to 2.2 there. Um, <laughs> but we did. We got to 2.2. But the thing to, you need to look at is 2.2 might make sense to you in terms of understanding the vulnerability and how, how likely is it to be exploited, for example, and what is the impact of it. But if you take that score of 2.2 to the business, does that make sense to them? We'll look at in a second why I think sometimes it won't. And then, again, sometimes as a, as a community, we're sometimes guilty of, of feeling security should just happen without really having to justify it because XYZ company got hacked last week. We, we might use that as, a, as a, a lever to try and get ourselves certain technologies bought or resources and so on. So what you again need to understand is what's important to your business and, and then use, be realistic about what your expectations are for security and use good justifications. And again, Chris is probably gonna give you more, more of a bigger stick to go and beat certain areas of the business within his talk, uh, his slide, sorry, than, than mine. So ultimately, we need to take this information, we need to speak in, in, in a business language, or, or more importantly, a language that your business cares about. So it will differ from, from one business to another, but in general, um, a lot of the things will apply regardless of where you're working. So firstly, you need to talk about things the business cares about. They don't care or even know about, in my opinion, probably rightly, injections and jackings and ponies. Or if they do, we saw what those things might look like in, in their heads when we tell them about it. Which means that if that's what they think about, it means you're not going to get what you want. So you need to think about what does the business care about and why should it invest in security. So they don't care necessarily that you have a SQL injection vulnerability, but what they do care about <coughs> is things like less loss of X percent of revenue. And Chris will give you more concrete information of how to start putting those kind of figures in front of executives in, in a short while. But then you also need to look at things like, you know, businesses really care about damage to brand, massively care about that, probably even more so nowadays than they would have a year or two ago with things like social networking. You know, if you're breached, you're the news of Twitter in security, at least for, for a day or a week, and you're the example that we always mark until the next company comes along. As, as harsh as it sounds, that's the way it is. And you can, you can use some of those things as, as real-world examples. I mean, look at RSA, for example. I think if you Google RSA security, uh, last week at least, I think about half of the results on the first page of Google were about them being hacked. You know, that's not, 
you know, using FUD or anything. That's actually taking a real example and saying to the business, you know, we're not maybe as big a brand as RSA, but look, this is what happened to RSA's brand after they got hacked. Um, then make sure that we present findings um, in, a, in a, a format that makes sense. And it's important to, to think about a format that makes sense to the business rather than necessarily to us. Because the CVSS might make sense to some of us, but that doesn't make sense to the business. So we need to translate that into a language and a format that they care about and make sense to them. So one of the, the biggest um, things I figured out when we were trying to really ramp up application security relax a couple of years ago was the most important thing I ever did was understand how the business scores risk. And what we found was that the business, in all of the other areas of the business, whether it's resourcing in projects, whether it's operational, whether it's finance, whatever it might be, they all scored risk in the same way. The, the rankings were slightly different because they had, you know, um, definitions specific for a project. So, you know, this project might sleep, slip by five weeks or from a finance point of view, it might be losing 10 major customers in a month. But then our security rankings were not even anywhere close to matching up to what the business spoke about and what they ultimately made decisions based on. So let's take that same SQL injection again and look at, look at it in terms of a much simpler but very common way of scoring risks. You know, probability times impact. It is a fairly simple way of scoring risk, but if that's the way the rest of your business scores risk, then that's the way you should at least present your findings to the business. I'm not saying dump things like CVSS. I'm saying when you take that data and want to get the business to look at it, put it in a format that they, they use and they care about. So if we look at this, if we take... We're just making up numbers here, I guess, to some degree. We give it a probability of three, which might be this happens every six months. Uh, and it's an impact of five, because we're saying when we put it in CBSS that it's a catastrophic loss of data. It's up to 25% of our system. It doesn't require authentication and so on. So it could be an impact of five. And the impact part is really where you need to work with the business and understand what an impact of five means for them. So an impact of five for finance might be loss of a million pounds of revenue, or might be losing the top five customers all within a month. You can put a security definition in there. So it might be someone exploiting the SQL injection vulnerability and dropping the whole of your database, or stealing the card numbers, or whatever it might be in your business. As long as it makes sense, and the business accepts that, yeah, that's a five, then an impact of five makes sense on whether they're looking at it as a, a finance risk, a business risk, an operational risk, or a, an application security risk. And if we look at this here, we get a total score of 15, the business has an appetite of 12, so we're immediately getting their attention. If you go in here and say it's 2.2, they'll look at that and say, that goes to right to the bottom of the pile and we'll get to it if we address these other hundreds of risks we've got. So ultimately, you need to speak their language, um, not all of the time, because I don't think any of us could really cope with doing that all of the time. But at times when you want them to make decisions uh, make decisions that you want them to make. Make sure that you're giving them the information that they need in the format that they want to see. And then ultimately understand that application security or security as a whole is no exception when it comes to resourcing. It actually doesn't really matter that there's, you know, the trouble we have with the economy at the moment. Um, regardless of that, there are, you need to justify your resources and be realistic with it. Don't, if you go away from here today and you, you look at your application security program or implement one, then you'll probably find hundreds of issues. If you go to the business with a list of hundreds of issues long, they might just look at that and say, that's too big for us to deal with. Or you might look a bit like the boy who cried wolf. So again, be realistic with your expectations. Score risk and score those issues in, in terms that they care about and take your most critical issues to them. Um, and then you might start to see things being addressed. And then ultimately, try to keep everything simple. What I try to do, whatever I do with application security, is follow the KISS principle. So keep it simple, stupid, or keep it short and simple. Depends on, I guess, who you're explaining the KISS principle to. Um, and just try and keep everything as simple as possible. It doesn't matter, I suppose, in, in how you do your analysis and how you come up with your results. You can do that however you want. But it's how you present that out to the people you want to make decisions. Try and keep that as simple as possible. 
Um, ultimately, speak with your developers and understand what they need to write secure code. <coughs> It, it, it isn't just a once a year um, refresh on what the OS top 10 is, it's much more than that. But you need to understand and listen to what they're telling you they need to write secure code. And then lastly, you know, work with the business, understand their languages, understand their formats, and understand what they actually care about. Okay, so I'll hand over to Chris now where he, he'll kind of carry on up the chain within the business. So, uh, Thanks Dave. I'll send to you. Um, so, if you don't know me, back in the 90s, I was Weld Pond at the loft, and I was sort of on the offense side doing vulnerability research, um, writing tools to hack systems. Um, but now I have a professional PR team, I've, which means that you know, I can win awards now, because if you don't have a professional PR team, you're never going to get these, right? Um, and uh, you know, my job is basically to help people. Um, write secure applications, put together application security programs so their organizations can produce uh, secure code, whether internal or uh, they're a vendor and they're selling that code. So, you know, why do we need executive buy-in is because to do application security, we typically need resources, um, we need tools, um, we need training, um, and also it's going to have an impact on the business. It's probably going to, at least in the beginning, change, change <coughs> development schedules. Um, and uh, we don't want it to be voluntary, right? We don't want some development teams to say, we're going to do secure code, and other ones say, it doesn't really matter to us. Um, if, it, if it matters to the business, it, it can't be voluntary. So because of this, we're going to need money, and we're going to need um, authority, or it's just not going to work. So this is why we need to get executive buy-in. We just can't get buy-in from the development team. So it's really a top-down and bottom-up uh, process to get uh, application security uh, working within a business. So the, uh, D D David talked about uh, you know, speaking, speaking the language of the business, and I'm going to make it even more simple here. This is the language that CEOs understand, CFOs understand, and CIOs understand. It's very simple. Speaking the language of the business means putting things in monetary terms. Um, this is how executives think. How am I growing my business? How am I growing my top line? It's dollars, right? It's not like how many states am I in? Uh, how many countries am I in? It's how, how, many, how, how many, what's the revenue number of the, of the business? Um, when they talk about lowering costs, obviously that's money too, but mitigating risk they think in terms of dollars. When, when we think about mitigating risk, it's really, it's, it's technical. What is the likelihood that this is gonna be uh, exploited or you know, can I make it so that the impact is less? Um, and, and, and we speak in technical terms. They speak, when they talk about, executives talk about risk, it's almost always translated into monetary terms. So we have to figure out a way to translate this into monetary terms or it's not gonna make sense. And, um, you know, D David brought up some, some points of like, you know, what is the lost sales going to be? You know, it's got to be translated into s some numbers. So here's some other examples of areas of risk in, in that, uh, that executives need to think about. They, they think about legal risk, right? When they're doing something um, that, uh, you know, m might, might be risky from a legal perspective, the lawyer has his own language or her own language that they speak in, uh, just like we have our own language. But at the end of the day, so that executive can make a decision on whether to sue someone or not, not, not uh, run some part of the business because it's too risky from a legal perspective, the lawyer puts the risk into monetary terms. What are the court costs going to be? What is a potential fine going to be? What will be the settlement costs of, of this? So the legal risk gets translated into monetary terms. Same thing with uh, compliance risk. There's all kinds of different um, things you need to comply with. Um, um, employment regulations, environmental regulations. You know, we, we think about compliance as you know, all, all IT focused, but there's a lot of compliance that businesses have to deal with. And if they're not complying, you know, um, what's the lost business? What are the fines? That's, that, that, that's what it comes down to. And, and, um, even, even fuzzy things like brand risk, marketing people translate this into dollars. What is my lost uh, business uh, going to be um, because our brand got tarnished somehow? You know, we're, we're getting sued by the government. 
you know, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing, we're measuring how that's impacting uh, the business to the, to the brand risk. So for security risk, how do, how do we do what these other professions are able to do, right? Um, they're, they're probably uh, more mature as professions, but they figured out a way to communicate what they want to get done and what they think has value to the business to executives. So um, one way that, uh, this is a model I'm working on, it's obviously not, not um, perfect, uh, this is a challenging um, thing to do, but translate technical risk into, into monetary risk using some data, data sources that are, that are out there. So to actually take you know, the, the technical risk, which is those vulnerabilities in your application portfolio, because um, speaking at a high level here, the, the business cares about all its applications, not just one which a development team might care about. Um, and look at expected loss derived from those vulnerabilities, the threat space data out there, um, and actual breach costs. So um, breach costs is something that um, there's really not enough data out there. Um, if your organization has been breached before, you can, you can use that, you can understand um, what your costs were, you know, what were your fines, what was your remediation costs, um, things like that, and then translate it uh, and the vulnerabilities that led to that breach and translate it to the other vulnerabilities in your, in your organization. Um, but if your organization hasn't been breached by application security, you probably don't have this data. So um, the, the Ponemon Institute, Ponemon Institute uh, did a survey uh, last year of these different industries, um, and uh, they, they, they broke it down into detection, escalation, notification, ex post response, and lost business, um, and came up with um, the average and then per capita, um, which is per, per record stolen. So this is kind of rec record based, so it's kind of a PII um, centric uh, view of the world, which is both good if that's the risk to your business is, is getting PII exposed, it's not so good if if, if your business is not that. Um, if it's not, you probably have to find some breach costs that are more related to um, your business and the risks in, in your business. But um, since this is the best data out there, I use that. And you can see the d down here, I don't know if you can see in the back, but there's different industries. Like uh, financial, it's $248 per record is the cost of a breach, whereas consumer, it's only $159. Um, Pharma, it's 310. So different, you can see right away that this is this is has some value to an executive because they're seeing like peer uh, industry verticals. What were their costs from from breaches? You have to make it you have to make it as relevant um, as, as possible. Um, and then a, a, a way to make vulnerabilities real is not to not to deal with them in isolation, but to actually look at threat space data and see what are attackers actually exploiting and that's actually leading to, leading to compromises that are impacting um, real businesses. Um, this data comes from last year's um, Verizon data, data uh, breach report. And um, th these were real, real, uh, real incidents that had a real impact to the business. They had, it, they had to um, investigate them, um, whether they were for compelled to do it because um, they're regulated or, or um, they needed to call someone in to you know, actually clean it up and figure out what happened. But Verizon collects this data. And uh, these are the different attack types um, that are used. And um, one of the attack types that's used quite often is, is hacking. Um, and th this adds up to more than 100 because a typical attack will have multiple, multiple stages. There might be... Um, you know, there might be hacking in order to install malware, and then, you know, so there's two, or there might be social engineering to install malware. Um, but 40 about 40% of the uh, attacks hacked some sort of issue uh, in, in, in software. And uh, over here is the, root, the different root causes. Uh, backdoor, control channel, SQL injection, command injection, cross-site scripting, authentication.